let me take this opportunity to congratulate you for uh, punishing genocide. Alhamdulillah. Congratulations. Alhamdulillah. As I said, um, it's a uh, it's a bittersweet victory. Obviously, we're we're just beginning, but the very very first step, as we understood it, was to attach a political cost to Zionism and the genocide. And Alhamdulillah, mm. we we played a, a significant part in that, and for we're grateful for the opportunity to do that. And now we're looking forward to what comes next. Mm. How was the mood at Jum'ah today? It was good. Most of the khutbas that, um, well, the khutbah that I listened to and the other people that I am aware of that were swapping notes about khutbas, many of the messages were attempting to be about reconciliation, unification, these sorts of things you would sort of expect. Um, but the mood is fine. Yeah, I didn't see anybody really um, either freaking out. Some of the grocery stores with more Republican, I think the, the, the mood at Hope, that Whole Foods is different than the mood at Walmart. <laughs> I think the, the people at Whole Foods are probably panicking, and the people at Walmart mm -hmm. are, are high fiving each other. Yeah. Uh, so that, we live in a divided land. Mashallah. So tell me about the the Muslim um, contribution to this, because I've heard kind of different things. I've been I've been listening to what you've been saying and the different brothers from across the pond. But what what do you think, in your in your opinion? I want I want to get get your views on okay, what's next? But before we get onto that, what's uh, What's the Muslim contribution been, do you think? Very good. I mean, it it is incontrovertible fact that Palestine and Gaza were among the most important factors in this election. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to figure that out, you don't look at what people say. You look at where they spend their money. Because politicians are liars, almost categorically, almost to a man. So they will say things in order to make you th think that that's how they really feel. But they they say things that are very, you know, misdirection. Right now, that everybody's wrestling over the narrative. The Democrats are saying, no, we lost because it was the economy, or no, it was immigration, mm. or no, it was this. Everybody's fighting over the narrative. But if you look <laughs> at where they spent their money, it's no accident that both Trump and Harris spent at, over a week in Michigan around Detroit and then their very last destination was the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. Swing districts, swing states with uh, swing states with large Muslim populations. And their mailers, the mailers that they were sending out, were explicitly about this messaging one way or the other. The Trump campaign uh, crunched the numbers. We found out the New York Times ran an article where the Trump campaign calculated that the undecided voters, the voters that were still undecided within the last few days of the election, were six times more likely to decide based off of Gaza. Wow! And that was, in, and that was completely borne out by by reality. They poured their last week or their last ten days um, into PR and meetings with the Muslim community. Trump went to a Yemeni cafe in Dearborn, Michigan. He went on stage and he praised Muslims and he prayed Ara he praised me, he praised Muslims and praised Arabs. He said that they are they're not terrorists, they're our friends, they want peace, all this this sort of thing. Mm. You, it might all be lies, who knows? But the thing is that he tried. Like he They actually, recognize that it's a formidable force. Exactly. And it if it were not a formidable force, they would have put their money and their time elsewhere. Um, the same thing with Harris. Harris was going around now. She, because she had essentially decided to go all in on the Zionists and not depart even an inch whatsoever. Mm. But she was still in Michigan up until the very end. And then in Pennsylvania, they were still trying to do some mixed messaging. If you saw the mini scandal where the news came out with, how different her messaging was in Michigan versus oh, Pennsylvania, yeah, yeah. right? And even the how different her messaging was to the Muslim community versus the the, the Jewish community. She was sending mess like mailers and and text messages to the Jewish community saying, "If you've seen mixed messaging, don't worry. Like uh, Harris is a hundred percent with Israel." So mm. she's trying to have her cake and eat it too. This is twenty twenty four. You're not going to be able to get away with that. Whereas she was busing people in from out of state, brown people, that was the, the criteria, they had to be brown, in order to go door to door in Detroit and in Dearborn to listen to Arab uh, voters. And they were told explicitly, and I was shown text messages, 
they were explicitly told to listen to their pain, sympathize with them, and guide wow. them back to voting Harris. So you don't do that if the Muslim vote doesn't have power. Like that was their that was their last. Their, if they had three last moves on the chessboard, all almost all of those moves are exhausted on the Muslim community. So yes, the Muslims don't let anybody tell you anything different. Now they want to deny it because they don't want the Muslims to think that they, that they have that much power going forward. They would much wow. rather ignore the Muslim vote and ignore the burgeoning Muslim political power. So now there's this sort of denial that it had anything to do with the Muslims um, or there's denial about uh, how many Muslims voted Trump uh, or excuse me, how many Muslims didn't vote for Harris. You know, some people are trying to peddle the 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 numbers that oh well most muslims voted for harris anyway so it wasn't them it was it was this other group or this other group or this other. but you don't you don't get that type of spending that type of time that type of resource allocation if you're not the major front and center decider in this election and that's exactly what happened so in other words it's the genocide stupid <laughs> yeah exactly it's the genocide stupid <laughs> so one thing i heard actually um i think you said this about the abandoned um, Biden campaign, the Madden, more than the abandoned, abandoned Harris campaign, is that there's been an attitudinal shift in Muslims. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I, that really made me proud of the, the Muslim uh, community there, mashallah. Can you yeah. explain to the, the viewers what you meant? Absolutely. No, okay. I'm just so, going to grab my charger so you can carry on. Sure. So the abandoned Biden movement started in the late fall, early winter of 2023. And it was started by people that are very politically astute, who realize that there's no ability to negotiate without leverage. And so they drew a line in the sand and they said that if we don't get a ceasefire by X date, then we are going to ensure that Harris loses. Or at that point, it was Biden. We're going to ensure that the Democrats lose the presidential election. Now, when this was the attitude and they came out or we, I mean, I was kind of always sort of on the sidelines, but, you know, involved a bit with the movement. Mm. There was so much skepticism. There was so much naysaying. The same things that you're hearing now about the Muslim, the Muslim vote doesn't matter. You guys are wrong. You don't know what you're doing. The math doesn't work out. You don't have the numbers. You don't do that. Like all the naysaying of the Muslim community came out. Like it was very, very intense. It was almost like no building the, sh the ark. People like walking <laughs> by ridiculing you. No, I'm serious. And I, I'm fully, fully like if you're not um, an actual person that's in the pay of one of these parties, I will have be happy to have grace with you and say, you know, now I hope you see what this was about. Now, what surprised me was that come March, I would say, come March, people that I never expected to come around to this sort of logic and fully abandon the Democrats did in, in droves. Uh, that I, There were people that we were having discussion with in, in dozens of WhatsApp chats, you know, every day for, you know, since October, since November, and these were people that were highly skeptical of abandoning the Democrats in December. And by the time we hit March or April, we really saw the mainstream, the bulk of the Muslim grassroots community lock in on that message, lock in on wow. the Democrats have to be punished. <clears throat> now, what was what was interesting to me was that this was not the preferred um, attitude or position of many of the Muslim elite, that there were people that either they had developed relationships within the Democratic Party, or they had run programs with the Democratic Party, or they were doing political advocacy, and most of their, they, they understood the Democrats to be a natural ally. Mm -hmm. So you had a really interesting um, confluence of factors where the Muslim community was on, was, was doing what they had to do, and certain both individuals and organizations were almost like nervously looking around like, well, I guess we can't say anything. So it became, it would have, and we saw this actually play out with Methi Hassan later, right? So the same mm -hmm. thing that played out with Methi Hassan where he tries every trick in the book to try to run interference for the Democratic Party. He tries to say Trump in the first hundred days, he's going to do all this, he's going to do all this, we're not going to have a democracy anymore, we're not going to have, it's going to be a dictatorship. All the, like, maximalist, worst case scenario. There were people, and there are people, and groups, 
that wished that they could have said what Mehdi was saying, but they understood, like Mehdi found out, that if they said those things, their credibility would be mm. shot because the grassroots bulk of the Muslim community would not have it. And that was something that I did not anticipate. I thought that this was going to be a, uh, a vanguard movement to the end and that it wasn't really necessarily going to catch fire like it did, but we would do the right thing and, and maybe we would um, get lucky, quote unquote, and then take credit for it and, and see what happened. But this was actually, again, by, by March, April, definitely May, because the, and the Democrats made it easy for us because they kept on with their insistence and their butchery and their arrogance. And you saw Stephen Miller and all the, the talking heads. Everybody was so evil. And they didn't have that one thing that Obama was able to leverage against the Muslim community, which was that sort of credibility and the charm and the articulation. They didn't have that. It was just bare, naked um, fascism, which made it really impossible for the Democrats to then come to us and say, well, if you elect Trump, then you're in for fascism. We're like, the Democrats are already there. <laughs> Every single thing. No. And this was the, the mm. conversation that and I wasn't I was able to just like sit back and eat my popcorn and, wa and watch <laughs> people who um, who three four months ago were skeptics were now holding these people's feet to the fire and saying that the mm. Democrats are already doing it. You're saying Trump's going to do this. The Democrats are already doing it. Like, what is worse? What could be worse? So that was the actual sentiment of the Muslim community. And then, you know, we tried to do what we could. My, me on my side, Jalal worked really hard. Sammy Hamdi worked really hard. A bunch of people worked really hard in order to try to just keep the pressure up that nobody would buckle at the end because that's what we were afraid of, that that the, the circumstances would be <clears> such that it would become in doubt and that people would buckle at the very and what we saw is the exact opposite the exact opposite more people came through than we expected but they came through in a way that we didn't expect they actually came through by voting for trump directly how do you know who they actually voted for you don't but it's anecdotal so i i can't count the number of people that when the last half of october came around messaged me privately and mm. said, doesn't it make more sense to vote Trump? <laughs> and I was, I would have to give people advice. I said, well, my position was, and, and, and was till the end, if you think that this is going to be extremely close and you are able to stomach voting for Trump, then there's a, there's a mathematical logic to that. And that is a logical action. If you think that it's going to be a blowout, like I did, I thought it was going to be a blowout for Trump the whole way. Mm. And you're more concerned about demonstrating with exact quantifiable measure what is the Muslim political power, like shifting it into like using the Green Party as a bank to store our votes to measure to say this is how strong we are. I was trying to think long term, but the, the uh, a huge number of people literally the day of told me that they flipped from they were planning on voting Stein. They got nervous that Harris was going to win and they ended up voting for Trump especially the people in Michigan and people in, I mean, I'm, I'm in WhatsApp groups, like mm -hmm. over 800 people, you know, yeah. or hundred, hundreds of people in Michigan, hundreds of people in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I was, I was surprised as well, probably. I, I have my, yeah, I have my, I have my spies. <laughs> you have to. Excellent. And a lot of spies on those groups or maybe people in a, you know, um, part of the Democrat, Democratic party machinery. Um, you know, they, they, kind of minions or whatever but um yeah so it's, it seems it's it seems like they maybe do you think it's a gen z thing as well or is it like all generations because i feel will, like gen z yeah. even here all over the world they they, they don't they're not as passive that's true. Uh, uh, as you know compliant as no, cordial that, that is, what's the group today <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true i don't know if that's what tipped the scale in the election but I do know that from my because we, we will have to wait to see what the data is on how much Gen Z turned out to vote in general. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, the younger generation is underrepresented in electoral politics. They usually don't get out the vote. But you're absolutely right about the character of Gen Z. And I've, I've experienced that a lot of, on the activist scene. So if you go to the activist scene, the protests and, and that yeah. whole the, the college scene, absolutely very unapologetic, very, um, you know, they need guidance. 
Like they, they make sort of some mistakes as we all do, but they're thirsty for the guidance, which I give them credit for. They Absolutely. want, they want someone to come in and show them, uh, what's the Islamic way to do all this. They want to politically organize. They want to have a, a real impactful change. They, they are not afraid to go to toe to toe with anybody. They're ready to go to toe to toe with elected officials. They're ready to go toe to toe with the universities. They're ready to go toe to toe with all of these threats that they have. They understand mm -hmm. the threats that are against them quite well, um, but they they need help, uh, and they need help with how to do that. So I'm just so definitely that's that's a that's mm -hmm. a, an accurate assessment. I'm not sure, and time will tell whether that translated into being an effect with yeah. the election or not. But did you see um, a, a shift in attitude in in older generations as well? Yes. Yeah, so that's the thing. Like the people yeah. who we know voted, Anecdotally. and the people who are in the in the chat groups and and duking it out over these issues they were the older generations they were that mid generation of the from 30 to 50 or from 30 to 55 and they i was i was pleasantly surprised how many people came around so from from afar it seems like it was basically look yeah trump says bad things about us or might say bad things about us but uh the democrats are doing actively doing bad things about us we need to just just take the bear the nuisance the the tedium of the first one to punish the second one yeah i mean the thing was the democrats made it easy in the sense that they didn't give anything for the muslim community like all of the democratic operatives would have loved i'm sure they were pulling out their hair they would have loved if the democratic party just gave them something to stand on but they gave them nothing and so in the face of such callousness and disrespect, I mean, for, for the love of God, you go, you run with Liz Cheney and you <laughs> brag, you brag in Michigan and you brag that a hundred neocons uh, are endorsing you. Like, as I said, mm -hmm. on, on Paul's program, it's as if they wanted to lose. It was the most cynical campaign I've ever seen. It was the most spiteful campaign to the Muslims I've ever seen as almost like it was almost like they're dangling a leash to the Muslim community and say, all right, time to get back on the leash, Muslims. Like that was mm -hmm. the attitude with which, so it became very, very hard. Uh, people saying, well, Trump, uh, you know, moved the embassy. We're talking moving the embassy, which obviously none of us like, moving the embassy versus we're, we're looking at kids' body parts every day in plastic bags. Like you can't, you can't compare those two things. Oh, Trump is going to, um, you know, end democracy. The Democrats already ended democracy. Like, like, look at how they pushed out anybody else. They undermined it. They made sure that it was Harris as opposed to anybody else. They didn't want an open primary. They didn't want any competition. That Harris was their hand. And look at how they go for their rivals, go against their rivals. They shut out mm. Palestinians at the Democratic Convention. They, mm. they, as I said, spit in the face of anybody who hopes that even wishes them well that has a dissenting opinion. They're so spiteful. Like, they really, really messed it up like like the it, it was almost a foregone conclusion so, so people were not willing to tolerate that type of discourse they were not willing to be told things are going to be worse under trump and e even now uh you have in all of these whatsapp groups and places you've got the one voice who is saying oh you guys don't know what you just did trump is going to do this trump is but most people don't care most people said like yeah that was a calculated risk that we took but mm. we could not give a raise and a promotion to someone who was in charge when this genocide happened and make no mistake. I mean, if you had, if, if Harris had won, it would have been a promotion. We would have zero leverage whatsoever if they were able to do that to us and then get rewarded by having another four years. And no self-respect or dignity either, to be frank. No, absolutely People. not. Um, but like you mentioned, Pretty much all of the mainstream legacy media, even lots of the kind of young uh, kind of podcast, non-Muslim podcasters out there, they're, they're talking about this being, oh, it's because of the economy, inflation, all that kind of stuff. So you're squarely saying, no, it was because, um, primarily because of the genocide? Yeah, absolutely. In terms you of these swings. Look at, look at where they spent their money. That's a, mm -hmm. Just look at where the campaign spent their money, what their messaging was. No one was talking about the economy in the last 10 days of the campaign. No one was talking about immigration, like once in a while. But if you've got 10 talking points, seven of those 10 talking points for each campaign was about 
was about foreign policy, was about Gaza, was about Middle East, was about Israel. That was what was on everybody's minds, lips, and that was where the expenditures went. So you have to follow the money. Mm. Wow. So one thing I'm really in, we're really interested in is turning like the m momentum into a movement, right? Yeah. Uh, um, what's the plan now? You've got all, you've got a success under your belt as a Muslim community there. You've got people riled up. You've got um, people getting a taste of some, you know, self-respect, dignity, standing on their own feet, not not waiting for someone else to give them anything, but demanding stuff. How do we? utilize this and build upon this now absolutely well i think two main lessons perhaps three that have come out of the last year what we learned is that who funds you runs you so the the previous playbook for a muslim individual organization if they wanted to if they felt like they wanted to get involved in the political advocacy space was to uh, get together your organization uh and your pitch deck and get funding from one of these big institutions, these what uh, Imam Dawood Walid calls the non-profit industrial complex, <laughs> to basically get funding outside of the community. Now, mm -hmm. what happens with that is that those funds almost always come with either strings attached, either explicit strings attached, or subliminal psychological strings. The idea that you have to, that the way to change is through relationship building, and through loyalty, proving your loyalty to a party or to a politician, and then getting favors later on. By the time you wait for those favors, you will be dead. They will they have not materialized, they will not materialize, they did not materialize. So people found themselves that many of the main orgs that purport, not to say many, some of the main orgs that purport to represent the Muslim community within the political advocacy space were completely dominated by funding outside the community. And therefore, mm. they were they were not accountable to the community. AstroTurf, a hundred percent. So when the community <clears throat> is saying genocide is a red line, and then their funders are organizations that are aligned with the Democratic Party, and they understand themselves to be funding other initiatives that are aligned with Democratic Party interests, and they then are in a position where they essentially turn back to the community and say, "Well, have you thought about um, immigration?" Like, no, we're talking about genocide. They have compromised themselves, whether they did it intentionally mm -hmm. or not. The worst of them did it intentionally in order to get a position and, and their career path. Whatever. But many of them did it unintentionally, where they came in with good intentions. They thought, this is how the game works. I guess this is what we have to do. You show up for all the PR things and take your selfies and, and you're, you're, you've got pictures with Harris and pictures with Biden and pictures with this senator and that senator. And you think that you're positioning yourself to make a change. They're using you for credibility. You're not going to make any change whatsoever. So mm -hmm. realizing that our community is infiltrated with some of these groups that have been, uh, that we have gotten very, very low ROI. We have very, very low re return on investment with this type of work. And learning that we need to be funded by ourselves, that you cannot hope to really make change if you are not actually funded by yourselves in the community and therefore accountable to the community. So we have some work to do when it comes to cleaning house and making sure that we isolate and don't platform those types of groups who are really haven't really done much of anything. They sell to the Democrats that they are the power brokers of the Muslim community. They sell to the community that they will give access to the, the elected officials and nothing really ends up trickling either way. They just put themselves up as the, as the middleman and the gatekeepers. So cleaning house and deplatforming and isolating and shutting out these orgs is very, very important. And the other thing that we learned is that you cannot do politics if you're not willing to talk to both sides and negotiate on both sides. That this is not, that our whole theory of allyship is off. Before um, October of last year, we thought, well, we find the people who are sort of progressive values, right? You know, the, the LGBTQ community and uh, um, racial justice community and pro-immigration and all the lefty issues. And this is our coalition. And we're going to march, you know, the aggrieved minorities are going to march through and, and you know, institute change. And that was, that didn't work. That didn't work. The ROI was very, very low. Now, what we did see, because people will respond and will we'll criticize that assessment, they'll say, but people were so 
supportive of Palestine. You had I heard I was told I was told by somebody who was a Muslim. I was a Muslim that said this. May Allah guide them and us. That queer children were linking arms and protecting Muslims when they were praying at a protest. Like, first of all, there is no such thing as a queer child. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, okay, we can respect people's good intentions and even their high toleration of risk. But what was the result of all of that allyship? What was the result of what we did? What did we get in, in exchange? Nothing. Like, to be frank, like we got a lot of noise. We got a lot of venting at protests. We, we did not actually stop the genocide. We didn't even slow it down. So now we have to go back to the drawing board and crunch the numbers and say, is this worth the investment? Because this comes at a price. What's the price that it comes at? In these circles, mm -hmm. we often have to leave our values at the door. They accept us for our identities, but they do not accept our values. And so now you've got a space. You show up to a protest where you show up to some sort of coalition work, and that space does not reflect your values. You can't even mobilize your community to come because your community will not come if there's rainbow flags everywhere, right? So what did you do? Your community did not come along with you, and they're patting you on the back, and they're saying, we support you, we'll do like this and that, the third for you, but you're not getting anything done. You're not getting results. So this entire arrangement needs to be rethought. And to add to add to that, they not only dominate the space culturally and say, well, yeah, well, how can you not be for queer liberation too? This is intersectionality. If you're going to be for Palestinian liberation, there are queers in Palestine. You have to be for, right? So that's asking us to give up our values. But then they also police us and tell us who we can and can't talk to. So if you wanted to engage with someone who's on the right, who's an anti-war uh, isolationist, on the right or like a god first republican or something like this they'd say oh you're you're this or you're that you're a, you know they'll have names for you and they'll say that they can't work with you because they have a puritanism to them mm -hmm. so this is a strategic mistake we cannot allow ourselves to join up with people who are gatekeeping and telling us who we're allowed to to be in coalition with that's not sovereignty. We have given up our sovereignty within the space of allyship. We need to reassert and reassess how we need to reassert our sovereignty in these spaces and reassess our relationships. Anybody who's trying to tell us who we can and can't work with, no, sorry, you don't get to work with us anymore. So we have to, because there are people on the right that are starting. Now we have Candace Owens and her types. We have people who, yeah, Tucker Carlson. All right. He's got some, some stuff, but You've got people who are starting. Thomas Massey is about to introduce legislation into the Congress that is going to attempt to prevent dual citizenship holders from being lawmakers. And that mm -hmm. is a direct attack at Zionism and the Israeli lobby. So it's not going. So, so what the Democratic sort of infiltrated either mentally or institutionally will say is, the only people in Congress asking for a ceasefire are Democrats. So what? You guys have placed yourself on the left and the right, anybody who would be a potential ally on the right, thinks that being a Muslim or being pro-Palestinian is a leftist Antifa issue. So you have actually pigeonholed us and limited what we can do by shacking up be with the left in a, in a loyalty first sort of way. So our whole idea of what we're doing when we're doing coalition work and who we're allowed to ally with and, and, and work with has to be completely revamped. The third mm -hmm. thing that we learned, the third thing that we learned is that making a demand, making a threat and delivering on that threat works. This was the philosophy of abandoned Biden. They said, we're giving you a mm -hmm. deadline. Here's the deadline. You need to have a permanent ceasefire by this deadline. If you do not do it, there will be political consequences. You're not going to be in office come November. And it worked. Okay. Now, what is that going to look like? Because many people are like, oh, we have to avoid another mistake. We can't just run to the right and do the, make the same mistakes with the right that we made with the left. That would be also a huge mistake. Because some people are saying, mm -hmm. oh, well, we're, Muslims are more natural allies to the right. we got traditional values. I don't buy that. It's not, it's not that simple. The right has different sub movements to it. different flavor of liberalism yes and, and it's just not that's not how you do politics you don't mm. it's not a loyalty we're not getting married we're not making baya we're not <laughs> hitching ourselves there's no rishta we're not <laughs> hitching ourselves to any one side 
what we're doing is who are the people who are willing to work on this issue? And then we're going to take them left or right. And nobody's going to tell us what, what to do. And nobody's going to tell us who we have to work with or who we can't work with. And then we're going to move forward from there. So now we have a, a, a trifecta or we have a tripart. This is very rare that happens in American politics where you've got both the house and the Senate and the executive are all the same party. Yeah. Can you, can you, ex- I was going to ask you about that actually, because can Absolutely. you explain to a non American? So I'll explain uh, the, to the UK the, audience. So you guys have the yeah. House of Commons and the House of Lords. Yeah. Because okay, the House so, of Lords for us is not elected or anything. It's just, you know. Right. Um, so we have House, our House of Commons is the House of Representatives. But we also yeah. have a House of Lords ish things with the Senate, but it is elected. Mm-hmm. Representatives only have two year terms, and there's many of them. There's, there are hundreds of them. Senators, uh, Senators uh, congressmen, women. Uh, this is all Congress. Okay, all of it's Congress. The Congress has two houses, a bicameral. Okay. You say parliament, we say Congress. I guess parliament, yeah. Congress okay. is more. Okay, so we have the Senate. There's two senators from each state. There's only 50 senators. And they're on six-year okay. terms. So they're they're there for longer. They're much more influential. Uh, so that's why we always have someone being reelected every two, four, six years. There's, there's a cycle. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's rare that one party control both the House of Representatives and the Senate, and the president. Hmm. And that's what we have now. So we have Trump now in the White House as the executive. The Republicans control the Senate, and the Republicans control the House of Representatives. They would like to keep this control as long as possible. right? If they're able to control this as long as possible, it's very easy for them to push legislation. If the House or the Senate were to flip blue in two years, they would have a much harder time accomplishing their goals. So what we need to do, in my opinion, in order to keep the Republicans honest and to make them deliver on their some of their rhetoric and some of their promises is to say, hey, Republicans, if you do not do X, and it could be a ceasefire, it could be arms embargo, it could we have to decide exactly what that is. If you don't do X by date Y, we are going to ensure that we flip the house back to the Democrats in two years time. Mm -hmm. And we're going to now make a list of how many people do we need to flip in order to do that? How many seats do we need to flip to put the majority in the Democrats? Where are they weakest? What are the races that are vulnerable? And who are we going to races as in uh... (laughs) electoral races, (laughs) which electoral race in which electoral race are are they vulnerable? I know I get this, this cross Atlantic yeah. stuff, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But sometimes the lingo, sometimes yeah, our, yeah. our lingo, we get a little in uh, in trouble. Anyway, so um, what were you saying? So basically, we're going to identify the... which which politicians would they say yeah. seats or when they're in a vulnerable seat. Yeah, yeah. Say. So which seats are vulnerable, and then we're going to recruit people and say we're going to run this person on a Democratic ticket or an independent ticket, depending on the situation. They're going to be anti-Zionist, and they're going to win against your Republican uh, representative to the point where we flip it if they don't meet our demands. Like so, that's how we have to. This formula is a working formula. It's the punishment Amazing. formula in order to keep them moving and to keep us on the offense. And that's what you have to do. Yeah, oh, that's a that's a very very. I really agree with that idea. I really, and we we obviously try something similar in the UK as well. Muslim vote campaign is more like a movement, like a with like a five election cycle kind of um, campaign, and it requires us to not be to obviously no loyalty to a party, but also no kind of undying hatred to a party either. You need to have that flexibility that look, you're controlling, uh, you're 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 acting rationally in that and and tactically that look. We, you know, it's not an issue of saints and sinners. It's not like one is a shaitan and one is an angel. But look, tactically, we're going to use our power to to push and to push to, for this one to win. Not because we like them, but because we want to exercise uh, exercise leverage, exercise power. Because nobody's going to give it to you. You have to you have to show a threat. Exactly, and that takes maturity because we've had some situations here where. The messaging gets lost because people think that they're pledging bayah when they when they vote. That's that's sort of the the immaturity that we have to to educate around. So, in Pennsylvania, for example, we had Bob Casey was a senator. He was a senator for 17 years. His father was a senator before him. Huge Zionist, tons of APAC money. 
we delivered a loss. He's gone now. Um, and, and we're going to, we're going to claim that victory definitely as ours hundred percent. Now the guy who's coming in to replace him, Mackenzie is also a Zionist. He's new to, he's newish to politics, so he doesn't have as much, uh, debt to pay, but he said horrible things about, uh, uh, about Palestine and, and he's made trips to Israel and things of this nature. Now the immature, the immature sort of uh, political take would be, well, you guys didn't do anything. You just replaced one Zionist with another, with another Zionist. Maybe he's going to be worse. That's not the point. The point is that you punt, you made an example out of somebody, and now you sent a message to everybody. And you send the message and you exercise the punishment as often as you have to until everybody gets the message. So maybe Mackenzie doesn't believe that it was the Muslim vote that actually toppled Casey. Okay, we'll take that. We'll wait for six years. <laughs> and then we'll prove it again if he doesn't, if he doesn't toe the line that we want him to toe. And then if you're able to do that, the politicians will get wise to it. They will say, okay, this whole Zionist thing, it sounds good. It's a lot of money, but it's not worth it. You're only going to be a one-term politician. So that's what it has to be. And, um, and we have to, you know, that requires comms, you know, communications, that requires media, requires lots of things, but we're getting there. I think people are, are realizing that there are situations in which you have to just punish somebody, even if they're not mm -hmm. going to be replaced by a, a better somebody. Because you're trying to, it's not about having your hero in office. That's not how politics works. It's about punishing certain political behaviors. Imagine like, you know, some people have dogs with like the shock collar. Like you get to a certain thing and it like shocks them. We are establishing a shock collar for politicians that they go beyond a certain line and they get shocked. Mm -hmm. And if, if we have to do it to every single one of those dogs, we'll do it. <laughs> Mashallah. I mean, it's uh, you know, very very glad to hear that. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, in summary, I'm presuming it's not just about the next six years, the next election, but between now and then, establishing comms, establishing yourself as a presence that look, we're watching you. You know, we're 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 going to hold you to account. We're counting. You know, the the the, the ways that you vote. We're we're establishing all of this this data and stuff. So, number one, you said going forward. Um, who who funds you runs you, yeah. So you're looking at uh, kind of more independent uh, funding for the Muslim community grassroots, getting rid of astroturf organizations, uh, parachuting in and stuff. Number two was rethinking allyship. Uh, you know, looking at it's not about uh, bay. It's not about being in camps. It's not about uh, you know pledging allegiance to one one group or another, but on a case by case thing on this issue. Anyone, left wing, right wing, whoever, MAGA, you know, whoever agrees with us on this point, you know, we work together on that. And it's no like, you know, um, no tribalism in that regard. And number three, you're saying um, establish, you're going to establish a longer term strategy of punishing any, uh, any uh, politician uh, who basically gets out of line and try to build your power that way. I should Absolutely. Talk about. You mentioned the, the the phrase ROI, right? A return on investment. Yes. Is, can you can you see a a future where you can get as good an ROI as as APAC does? Because they spend a few hundred million and they get billions in return. Absolutely, I think <laughs> that's we like can the get best there. Uh, oh, best investment yeah. ever. <laughs> I absolutely think we can get there because it always takes more money to prop up falsehood than to support mm. the truth. So they mm. have to sp they have to spend that much because what they're asking people to run cover for is so despicable and so evil that it requires that many resources and that much attention in order to mm. keep it going. If we were to exercise a tenth of the effort and money that APAC exercises, we could probably get the same results. I have no doubt about yeah. that. And you have that money? It's there. It's there. It just needs to be organized. It just needs to be organized. You know, outnumbered, you're out, we're out organized. 100%. Yeah. In terms of um, Republicans, right? So going forward now, what's your assessment? I mean, like 20 years ago, you know, we, we remember that, that it was a time, younger people might think, what well, they, they can't imagine a time where Muslims were kind of uh, close to Republicans and all that family values, all that kind of stuff. But then, obviously, it didn't stop the war on terror. It didn't stop them spying on you and, and locking you up and, you know, genociding uh, all over the world in, in, in Muslim lands. What what lessons can we learn from there? You did touch on it a bit in terms of don't be 
you know, tribalistic and stuff. But are there any other lessons in terms of going forward now? You have Republicans in all three kind of branches of the state. Uh, what 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 lessons can we learn from um, the last time round? Muslims no, were kind of in bed with. Uh, Absolutely. So to speak, no oh, tribalism is precisely the word for it. I'm glad that you used that. I think 100%. We need to stop being tribalistic when it comes to politics, and we need a more sophisticated political language. Because in reality, the the right is not the same in 2024 as it was in 2016. Um, and there's lots of scholarship on this stuff. Like w w Reaganites are not the same as neocons, and neocons mm. are not the same as Tea Partiers, and Tea Partiers are not the same as MAGA. Right? You, we actually have to stop being so tribalistic and like. Republican bad, Democrat good, and we need to actually pay attention to the movements that are going on, and everything's fluid. The people don't realize that. Everything is fluid in politics. Everything is constantly shifting. And not rather, just genders. Not just genders, unless you're on the left. <laughs> and that's kind of, yeah, exactly. But you have to take a steering position when it comes to how things are developing and moving. Mm. So right now, a perfect example, there's a huge tussle on the right as to what type of Trump administration we're going to see. Um, a lot of conservatives are against the Pompe uh, against uh, Mike Pompeo coming back and returning it to a major role within the, the cabinet. He was a hawkish neocon type. Uh, Bolton was also a hawkish neocon. So even though Trump ran on a populist uh, message and a populist campaign, he definitely had neocons in his in his cabinet that acted like neocons. Mm -hmm. If I, I was asked recently, like, what are the two most harmful uh, movements left and right to the Muslims. And I actually think at least in foreign policy, but honestly, in general, I would say on the right were the neocons and on the left were the neoliberals. I think both mm. the neocons and the neoliberals were the worst things for Muslims um, because of the securitization, the security state, the surveillance state, the foreign policy, all of these things. I really don't like the, the progressive trans agenda either, but Look at how much we've been able to push back on that as well. They don't have as much teeth as the neoliberal state, I think, my personal opinion, though they're bad. That's not the point. The point is to actually talk in sophisticated ways about these different movements and be able to understand what is the potential which, with each one and what is the limitation. And then which ones do we want to engage with and try to enhance versus which ones do we want to undermine and mm. attempt to neutralize. So when it comes to the right, we certainly have a strategic <clears throat> interest in making sure that the America first, God first Republicans, the ones that are anti-interventionist, uh, that they triumph over the neocons. That is 100% a priority for the Muslim community, that mm. we want to be engaging. Thomas, I bring up Thomas Massey a lot, and Thomas Massey is a demonstration of how poor and unsophisticated the Muslim political thinking was up until very recently. He was targeted by APAC. They tried to primary him in his in his uh, Republican primary with a Zionist Republican, and he won, thankfully, but the Muslim community did absolutely nothing to help him. Now, despite that, he seems to be a person of principle, or at least more so than many Republicans, so he's still doing things that are... Yes, he, he opposes U.S. Um, intervention in Palestine, maybe not for the same reasons that you and I do, but he still does. So we have a strategic interest in engaging and enhancing and strengthening people like mm. Candace Owens, people like Thomas Massey, people that are this type of Republican and this type of conservative and attempting to neutralize and to undermine the Ted Cruz's and the Mark Rubio's. And the people who are and, and the John Fettermans and the and the you know these people who are full on neocon, very uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic sentiment. Um, and the same goes for the left. There are other movements on the left. There are neoliberals. There are centrists. There are democratic socialists. There are far leftists. We have to assess who are the people that are strategic for the Muslims to enhance and to strengthen, and who are the ones that are actually really unstrategic or they, they are against our interests and try to neutralize yeah. and undermine them we have to get over that impulse you know we have this thing that this voice sometimes actually real people saying you know how can you support so and so when she said xyz we have to get out of that kind of that impulse that it's not about you know rishta <laughs> it's not about you know um uh, joining their tribe but you have to have keep them at an arm's length but say recognize that look tactically yeah this person is far better than or far less bad 
uh, compared to to that person, and and we have to we have, we have to find a way to to get that maturity across. Because I can just see someone saying, "Well, last year you told us you know, abandon uh, right. Democrats, and now you're telling us to vote for." And what, what's all this flip flopping going on? Yeah. We need that kind of a political maturity. Absolutely, and you have to pay attention to how people react to these things too. Like I met with mm. Jill Stein uh, in a private meeting, and I I told her I said. We understand that the Green Party's position on LGBTQ is not our position as a Muslim community. And th this is not going to change. It's like, we understand you're not going to change. We understand we're not going to change. But what our biggest anxiety is, and therefore it's an obstacle to your campaign, is people are going to be afraid of the overreach, especially with our religious institutions, if you go with a maximalist LGBTQ agenda. And so if you're going to ever speak about this issue which she didn't really a lot because i well i also told her i wouldn't recommend speaking about this at all but if you have to mm -hmm. then absolutely then you should be sure to mention religious freedom and the sovereignty yeah. of religious groups and their practices and their houses of worship and their schools and things like that in the same breath because mm -hmm. if you don't it's a non-starter you're gonna pe you're gonna have people who are never gonna vote for you in a million years uh from the mm -hmm. muslim community even if it's the strategic move because you're basically advertising something that's so repulsive to them. Now, she didn't end up taking that advice. Uh, so uh, she actually posted something on her social media within the last week or two of the campaign that was totally a maximalist LGBTQ thing. So, I mean, a lot of people, did, I'm certain that that probably turned people more towards Trump than towards, mm -hmm. that, uh, than towards her. And it was also the notes that you take down when you're talking to and you're trying to play hardball and you're trying to negotiate with a politician. Is this person responsive to what I told them that this has to happen? It didn't happen. You're done. Like, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you had your chance and now I moved to somebody else because there's there's other fish in the sea. We have to be comfortable walking away and getting back in the game and seeing seeing what else is out there. You're never going to get anywhere through this loyalty politics of just, you know, yeah. attach yourself to this person or this party. You know, should I tell you a secret? Please. <laughs> last time last time around when Trump was elected, I really kind of, I mean, all we saw was all this um, kind of scaremongering against him. He's so evil. He's this, he's a fascist, he's this and that. And this time around, all of that stuff that was coming from the, the kind of mainstream liberal media, it was like it had zero effect on me. I was like, this. I've seen your because um, first time around, I bought we bought into the the liberal criticisms of him and 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 the smears and so forth. But now we've seen the liberals for the real genocidal face of liberals, a different flavor of white supremacy. You know, like Malcolm X would say, you know, the the smiling fox compared to the wolf. And I really wanted Trump to win, <laughs> and I was like, uh, I've been following, like watching, because he was he's been on real kind of podcasts and 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 just getting out there and that's when i saw you know i think about a month ago i said this guy's gonna win he's going on all these podcasts he's speaking people directly he's just riffing he's just going going to to rallies and just <laughs> i think he's just let's just be quiet and listen to music and start, start swaying and stuff this like it, it's just he's getting around he's circumventing all of that machinery um that's that's been creating these narratives of, of fear mongering and and um and yeah i think i thought perhaps the the stuff we were told about him first time around and since then was not true is is he a nice guy it doesn't matter the thing is that he's a politician and that's the thing like like there is he always, is he a politician or is he someone he who's actually well, trying to enter this with different rules and stuff i don't think that trump believes in anything but himself mm. right i think that and that's why he he changes and he flip-flops and he he you know he's got an enormous ego he wants to be seen in a positive light he would love to bring some he's very unsophisticated when it comes to his understanding of foreign policy and stuff like that but he would love to be seen as the person who makes peace in the middle east he would love nothing more than to be given like a Nobel Peace Prize or something like that because it strokes his ego. Yeah. Now, some that's my, been my argument for a while that you can you can manipulate somebody like that, right? You can create situations in which their interests align with your interests. He's not yeah. an ideologue. He he does say that, you know he has personally suffered at the hands of the deep state and stuff like that. So I think yeah. 
of all the things or, or any of the things that he might actually believe in are his whole things about with the deep state. But even that, like if he was so against the deep state, then why did he have Pompeo and people like Bolton in the circles? Like these are deep state guys. And, um, you know, and they still have those people in well, his, around it, him. It's tough. They're, they're, they're jockeying right now. So that'll mm. be really interesting. Is it going to be a Kushner Pompeo sort of administration or is it going to be he's got his, his Trump Jr. is very different from Kushner. And he's got mm. his other son-in-law, his guy. daughter, the Lebanese guy. Yeah. A lot of people are saying that they're going to have a lot more influence. And I, I was told some, uh, I was told privately from people who had meetings with Trump that he's basically pushing Kushner out. If that's true, that's actually a very, very positive thing yeah. for the Muslims yeah. because Kushner is a Zionist. Um, but the thing is that I don't believe that Trump believes in much. I think that he's he's except uh, himself. Except himself. Which you would rather deal with somebody like that than uh, than somebody who's ideologically attached to Zionism. Trump's not a good person. He's not a moral person. He's done terrible things. He did he did horrible things in in Yemen. Let's not forget that. So we don't. I don't believe in, and I don't think it's necessary to rehabilitate Trump as this like yeah. misunderstood person. Now, what's true about what you're saying is that the Democrat and liberal smear campaigns are so vitriolic that they cease to become credible so yeah. you can't you can't separate fact from fiction anymore and this actually happened when it came to um you know they were going after trump throughout his whole uh tenure with his russia connections and it was it was kind of farcical they never were able to get anything really on mm -hmm. him so then when january 6th happened which was actually something major which i actually agree was like a uh, um, uh that's a problem. It's like the boy who cried wolf. It's exactly like the boy who cried wolf. It's like mm. The Democrats had no credibility left. They're just like, you guys mm. have it in for Trump, and it muddied the waters. It would have been a, a clear moral thing to be like, hey, look, let's join up with Pence, and let's join up with the other Republicans in the military. I said, this is too far. We can't have this as a precedent for challenging election results. This is going to endanger democracy. But they had always had it out for Trump. We're always trying to catch him on something, and so they didn't have any credibility. So what their their um their viciousness and their uncharitable and and the other thing too is that the democrats will criticize republicans for things that they do when they're in office it's they're they're so tribalistic and partisan that yeah. it makes them impossible to believe just like how how many americans did not go with the official line and they fought the official line about covid and everything like that because the pharmaceutical industry has no credibility Nobody trusts the pharma industry or the health industry mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. because they've been screwing people over. Pardon my language. They've been they've been exploiting people for decades. And then you expect everybody to fall in line and listen to the CDC and say that, oh, yeah, let's do whatever the CDC. Like you you can't possibly. That's not a mm -hmm. rational thought. So this is the same thing. The Democrats, when they smear Trump, you always have to take it with a grain of salt. Maybe some of the things that they say are true or there's a, a kernel mm -hmm. of truth or there's some truth <clears> in it. But it, it has become very, very hard to separate what is the actual real threat from what is just democratic propaganda because they want to make him seem like the worst thing ever because they want you to, mm -hmm. to vote for them while they send us vacuous candidates with no personality and no policy. Mm. You know, I was thinking when I was hearing some of these kind of um, people crying on, on the radio and, and uh, kind of having a breakdown, that oh, this is terrible, Trump, and then all three you know, or the House representatives, the, the the Senate, everything is. I was thinking maybe if we ask these people, look, how do you feel right now? Oh no, everything's everything's kind of closing in around us now. How do you feel about this person having his finger on a button, controlling seven hundred military bases all over the world? Yep. And I was just thinking, like, could there be something here where you get people who are actually shaken up to get them to realize that? Wait a second, is there? Is it a good idea to have such an expensive, such a vast empire, so much, so many boots on the ground, different countries, so many nuclear weapons, so many this, so many, so much, so much power all over the world, and and to try and maybe in in that some way, I know Jill Stein ran on the ticket of okay, you know, closing all the bases and a dismant dismantling empire. Is there a way we 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 can carve out some kind of campaign that? Look, you realize that this someone like this, in your in your own words, is a threat to the world, a threat to democracy, whatever. Now, you know, how about working on scaling back 
some of the, the 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 boundaries of this this U.S. empire. I mean, he does seem like a person who's all America first and you know anti-interventionist and isolationist and stuff. And that could maybe help uh, in that regard if he's not surrounded by neocons. Do you think there's something in there? I mean, there's something uh, uh, sort of like that that's already underway. I mean, that is a faction of the right at this point. Um, I think that one thing that nobody has tried yet is to attempt to run a nonpartisan campaign around process issues so that we have a fair fight. What do I mean? I mean that there are certain things that make American elections very easy to buy, very easy to influence. Like, yeah. why does APAC have so much power? There are very, very common sense issues. Like Trump, I think one of his, his slogans is uh, common core of common sense or something like that. Like there are certain things about how decisions are made politically in the United States that the vast majority of Americans agree with that nobody has really seriously attempted to <clears throat> sally a campaign for. Yeah. Imagine if you put together a very, very targeted we're not going to get involved in the culture wars. We're not going to get involved in the social issues. We're going to fix campaign finance. We're going to fix uh, ranked versus first past the post voting. We're going to fix uh, the whole super PAC you know, phenomenon. We're going to fix all of these things that determine how politics happen in the United States, which makes it very susceptible mm. to moneyed interests and to uh, external interference. And, makes the fight so much harder like you could fight apac by making a muslim apac or you could make them register under fara and take money out of politics and there won't be anything like apac ever again what's right? fara so, uh, fara is the foreign agent uh something or other act where it forces groups to register within the the federal government as acting on the interests of foreign agents mm. and so apac has not been forced to register as a foreign agent even though it acts in the interest of israel wow. that would limit what they can do right there are things on the books that are law that hasn't been applied the Leahy acts mm. which actually affect whether u.s military aid can go to nations that are committing atrocities and violating international laws these things are law right but yeah. the thing is that if you find it, the, the thing that we have to do, or one of the things that we have to do is study the way that, that decisions are made rather than only focus on the end product of policies. What are the processes that arrive at these policies in the first place? If you look at the political terrain, we have a very unfair fight. The, the inputs are enormous, all these sorts of things. How do we actually level the playing field? Nobody has actually attempted to do this to my knowledge. And I think that that would actually be yeah. a really interesting attempt or a really interesting movement to initiate okay that can be another thing you can you guys can work on <laughs> we got a lot of work to do it's getting late here we've got to we took a lot of time let's let's regroup after a few weeks you get you crack on with uh you know trying to trying to influence the tussle within uh uh trump's inner circle and outer circle as much as you can inshallah congratulations again uh, we'll stop the recording in a minute. You can put your MAGA cap back on. But uh, <laughs> for joining us. Well, let's let's regroup in a few weeks, inshallah, and uh, and, uh, and see how you get on. And Zakmakhera right. to you at home for watching. If you like this podcast, as usual, give a like and share. Let us know in the comments. Get involved. Have your say. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.